All right, folks. Next up is Lauren Goodman and Lucy Riley Schell. But let me bring your presentation up. You have two? One's for the Q&A, just a back, back up for the Q&A. Okay. But yeah, that first one is the presentation. Yeah. All right, here's the one. Watch the cables. Okay, thanks. And you just hit the, these arrows here. Beautiful. That's all you have to do. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so pleased to see so many faces here and online. Hello out there in TV land. Hi, Mom. Um, so a brief background about me, in case we haven't met before. Uh, my name is Lauren Goodman, and my background is not history, but in creative writing and filmmaking. My first love is storytelling. But during the pandemic, like a lot of us, I developed a new interest, and specifically in cars that go really, really fast. And I started volunteering at the Revs Institute down in Naples, Florida. More on that later. But it was while I was there I encountered this beautiful eight-cylinder Maserati that was entered in the 1940 Indy 500. Now, you can see on this car the uh, French flag, the American flag, and then very curiously, this name painted on the side, the L-O-R Shell Special. And when I learned that the L there stands for Lucy, I had to know more. And it became kind of a passion for me. And I, I'm looking forward to sharing her story with you. So today's presentation, I'm going to give you a brief overview of her life and accomplishments. She was an established rally driver in her own right, but her real legacy was putting a little car company named Delahaye on the map. Um, in talking about Lucy's work, we're also going to touch on her portrayal in the media at the time, and then later how she got ignored in some secondary sources about the history of motorsport. And finally, finally I'll sum up with just a few little thoughts um, about her identity. And so I plan to talk for about 20 minutes, and then I, I have a, about 10 minutes for Q&A. And please ask anything, because I have a whole bunch of extra slides in case anyone has a question. Um, Lucy Marie Jean O'Reilly was born in Paris, October 1896. Uh, her father, Francis, was an American businessman whose own father had immigrated from Ireland. And the O'Reilly money came from building the railroads that were the lifeblood of the Gilded Age. Francis was already in his late 40s when he decided to settle down in Paris with a young French widow. And when he died in 1937, he left Lucy her own personal fortune. Now, Francis frequently traveled between Paris and Pennsylvania to attend business, but Lucy was 18 before she made her first trip to the US, where in fact in Reading, um, her arrival was, was news in the town paper. And you can see here, she's bringing news to the people of the town about her work as a nurse um, at the uh, military hospital in Val de Grasse in Paris. 
Really, when she was a teenager, she saw young men returning from the front, suffering and sometimes dying from the wounds they received. And later in life, Lucy would again find herself locked in a battle with the Germans. Now, another important character in this story is her husband, Lori, um, whom she met around 1912, and they were married outside of Paris in 1917. Salim Lawrence Schell, who was known always as Lori, was born in Geneva to an American businessman, and a family connection gave them first empl employment at Butterosi. Um, some of you classic car lovers may know the name Butterosi. In addition to war goods, they also constructed a few cars of their own, which were terrible. But he ended up also working for um, some coachworks around Paris, and he would provide a lot of the coachwork for Lucy's cars um, during her life. Now, here are the shells, and uh, they were a study in contrasts. So Lucy was gregarious, assertive, Lori was soft-spoken and diplomatic, but their egalitarian marriage made them a powerful team both on and off the track. Lucy and Lori ran the Monte Carlo rally together numerous times, sharing both navigational and driving responsibilities. And here, they actually had a reporter come along with them one year, and he wrote a wonderful series of articles about his adventure with the shells. Um, as Rene Dreyfus, who became very close to the couple later in life, wrote in his autobiography, there was no question but that she was absolutely an equal partner to Lori in their marriage. There was no subservience, no unswerving obeisance, no pipe and slippers. Indeed, she was the driving force of the family. Lucy and Lori had two sons, Harry and Philip. Harry seems to have inherited the racing gene from both sides of the family, more on that later. And the Shell family resided both outside of Paris at, at Brunoy um, and in Monaco. So we've covered the world that Lucy was living in. Don't worry, we're gonna talk about the cars now. So Lucy was already a mother and wife when she began to race seriously. Her first race results show up in the French press in 1927, which would have made her about 31 years old. Auto journalist Maurice Philippe called her a decisive driver. And we can see she liked serious cars, serious French cars. That Talbot would have been branded as a Duroc if sold in Britain. At her very first hill climb in 1928, Lucy came first in her class. The reporter was surprised to see a woman had entered the race, but he said, if this little lady keeps at it, she's going to see some good results. And good results she did indeed have. Here's just a selection of things I was able to pull from papers at the time. Now, Lucy's specialty was the rally, and the Monte Carlo was her white whale. Lucy, with Lori as co-driver, placed as high as P2 overall at the 1936 rally and lost out to a couple of Romanians in the stripped down Ford by mere fractions of a point. It was her search for the right mix of performance, power, and reliability that led her to call on the factory offices at Delahaye. Now, at this point in time, Delahaye was a stuffy firm with a background in long-wearing, sturdy truck engines. The general director of Delahaye's factory, Charles Weifenbach, known to everyone always as Monsieur Charles, um, had grand plans to lead this company into a new era. Key to this plan were his engineer, Jean-Francois, and a plan to break into the market for high-end, high-performance sports cars. Delahaye unveiled two new Superlux models at the 1933 Paris Auto Salon, uh, the 12 Chevaux and the 18 Chevaux. These two Superlux models were really just older models with updated suspension. But the stir in the press was enough that it caught Lucy's attention. She appeared with Laurie in tow at the offices of Monsieur Charles to order a special. She wanted the bigger engine of the 18 Chevaux put into the smaller chassis of the 12 Chevaux. Monsieur Charles said, no, 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 not possible. The reason he said it wasn't possible, it was because his engineer, Jean-Francois, was trying to figure out how to uh, do just that so Delahaye could start its own factory works team. However, I will point out here that, uh, as this loads, uh, 
when <laughs> Mr. Charles went to test his factory uh, works team specials, Lucy still managed to outperform them in her regular car. So he decided, you know what, maybe she is, after all, the, uh, the best owner for one of my specials. Uh, you'll also note here that Delahaye um, wanted to further prove the merit of their new cars by showcasing one of their specials in a few world record attempts. Um, they were actually able to set a few world records at Mallory, uh, one for the 10,000 kilometers and one for the 48 hours. It was going really, really well. Uh, they were beating records previously held by Renault. Uh, and this was enough buzz that before Jean-Francois could finish constructing Delahaye's first real sports car, the 135, Lucy had already ordered six. And she called on six of her wealthiest friends to order some as well. And that ready cash enabled Delahaye to build a works team. So by way of thanks, they built Lucy a Competition Speciale of the 135, the 135CS, which would become one of the most important race cars ever to come out of France. Now, Lucy was a determined, gregarious, and well-connected person. She was already becoming a team owner in all but name. So for this little fleet of 135CSs, she decided it was going to be her own team, which she dubbed Blue Buzz and it premiered at the 1936 Paris-Nice rally. Now, writer Neil Bascom in his fabulous book, Faster, asserts that her dismal performance during the hill climb portion of the Paris-Nice gave Lucy pause about her own driving career and inspired her to focus solely on team management. She recruited Rene Dreyfus as lead driver, and Rene is one of the great talents ever to come out of France. Dreyfus had a proven track record as a Grand Prix winner, having driven for Bugatti and Maserati, and even having an offer from Ferrari. But then uh, Mussolini decided he didn't want a Frenchman in his Italian car. And the only other serious team in Grand Prix racing at that time were the Germans, and the Germans didn't want a Jewish guy in their car. But Lucy surprised Rene and said, hello, how would you like to join me? It's going to be totally professional. Don't worry. And Renee has a wonderful observation about this meeting, how she just kind of would ensorcel people um, and get them on her side. Um, so I'll say at this point a note about the Delahaye. Well, really, even though the 135 was a sports car, it was essentially using a modified truck engine. <laughs> and this might have been, you know, laughable, except it gave the car incredible reliability. So Jean-Francois just focused on, listen, I'm going to make the car as light as possible to increase the torque and take it from there. And you'll see here I have some results for the 135 CS. Um, you'll note that it's both under the team name Blue Buzz, and sometimes it was run under her later team name, Ecurie Bleu. But in rallies and in speed races and in endurance races, this car was um, really marvelous. Now, that was going well, but the outlook for French victory and the grands épreuves of the European calendar was grim indeed. Of the championship Grand Prix run in 1936, no French car finished in the top five. For a country that had once produced Delage and more, this was hugely embarrassing. This actually goes back to um, um, Catherine's earlier presentation, the anxiety that the Germans felt about national pride um, also was happening in France. Um, so the ACF, which was the governing body for motorsport in France, and the French press got together and made a plan. They enlisted the government's help to raise money for the cause of French glory on the track. A tax on every new driver's license went into the Fond de Course. A new Grand Prix formula was set to begin in 1937, and the ACF was giving French automakers an incentive to create a costly new race car. A prize of one million francs to the constructor who could post the fastest time on the track at Montlhery. Now, at this point, I want to point out Delahaye had already closed down its factory works team. There were a couple bad wrecks at the Grand Prix de Marne, and Monsieur Charles kind of lost his stomach for it. 
But after the announcement of the million franc prize, Lucy paid another visit to the offices of Monsieur Charles. She had decided to create her own Grand Prix team, and she would pay Delahaye to build her a car for the million franc contest. I'm just trying to go down here. Oh, well. Gotcha. Well, anyway. So Jean-Francois busied himself building a brand new car with a brand new engine from the ground up. And Lucy busied herself running the 135 CS in various events. And finally, when this new Delahaye was ready to test and was unveiled, they kept it a quiet affair. Uh, per Peter Stevenson, the car was ugly, but boy, could it go. It only took Dreyfus a few laps to decide this ugly car was instead truly beautiful. And in it, he managed to drive it and outperform Bugatti to win the million franc prize. With this creation of this new Grand Prix car, the 145, as well as all the victories already, already under Lucy's belt with the 135 CS, Delahaye was celebrated as the return of French glory to the track. And here you can see Monsieur Charles giving Rene Dreyfus a big kiss and later being made an officer in the Legion of Honor in recognition for those efforts. But the big test was yet to come. You see, adoption of the new formula for the Grand Prix was pushed back to 38, and Delahaye still had to prove itself against German teams. At the 1938 season opener at Pau, it was the little David of Delahaye with its Jewish driver and American money against the Goliath of Mercedes with, its, with lots of money from Hitler. Um, I can only imagine how Rene Dreyfus felt about cro when he crossed that line in first place. He then went on to win at Cork, um, and this would be a pinnacle for this new Grand Prix team, the Curie Bleu. Now, if you're wondering where Lucy was at Poe, she wasn't. Uh, at that time, Major Concours and the Nice Salon were happening on the Côte d'Azur. Sources report that at least four of the V12 engines went into touring cars, carrossés by the likes of Fagoni and Chapron. Car manufacturing is a business, after all. And um, Lucy's wins both on the track and at the Concours show that Delahaye is the peak of performance and style. And here she is modeling her winning cars, along with um, her English bulldog, who was also award-winning. Uh, these Grand Prix victories, as well as other finishes with the 145 equipped as a sports car, eventually made Dreyfus the champion of France for 1938. Unfortunately, Mercedes and Auto Union dominated from mid-season on, and the ACF decided, well, we need another distribution from the Fond de Course to jumpstart more innovation. They decided this time to award the funds to the constructor showing the most promising plans for a future car. And uh, they ended up awarding those funds to Talbot Lago. To say that Lucy was enraged would be an understatement. In protest, Lucy withdrew her team, the Curie Bleu, from the French Grand Prix at Rheim, as it was hosted by the ACF. This caused an uproar in the papers. Without Delahaye, surely the deck is stacked against French constructors at our home race. The sentiments were roughly, how could this lady do this to us? How fickle is the press lauding her just a few months earlier as a hero for France? Now the ACF then tried to strong arm Lucy and Le Curie Bleu back into the Grand Prix by stipulating that withdrawal would also mean they were disqualified from the constructors championship. So Lucy wrote an open letter to them in the press. And what's truly incredible here is we have her own words about her ownership and leadership of the team. She is the interested party. She makes the decisions. It's her call. Now, Lucy eventually changed her team name to Le Curie Lucy O'Reilly Shell. She was clearly irritated with the ACF and wanted to remind them who exactly had made those victories happen. Now, 1939 was a tough year for her. The next iteration of the Delahaye car, the 155, never fully materialized. 
And in 1939, Lucy had to run the previous season's 145s against a Mercedes with an updated engine. By the time the team arrived in Switzerland for the Grand Prix, Lucy switched her team to Maseratis. I think it's very telling she didn't choose another French mark. At home, tragedy struck. Uh, Lori was killed in a car accident that also badly injured Lucy. Um, Renee Dreyfus stood by her sons at the funeral because she was still in hospital during Lori's funeral. And then he had packed up and reported back to base because after all, France was at war. But it didn't keep her down long. Within a month, she'd contacted Dreyfus because she had a new plan. She was going to send a French team to compete in the Indianapolis 500, bringing more attention to the, co the French cause, uh, to the isolationist U.S. Now, I'm going to use this moment to plug for the Revs Institute down in Florida. Uh, not only is the collection incredible, but we have an app and a website with lots of stories and pictures and videos. So if you want to know what happened to her team at the Indy 500, I'm afraid you're going to have to go to revsinstitute.org. Now, Lucy wasn't well enough to make the Atlantic crossing uh, by the time it happened, but that's perhaps fortunate because no women were allowed in the pits. Dreyfus later recalled how his teammate's timekeeper, who also happened to be his wife, was built a special tower so she might watch the driver without setting foot in the forbidden zone. That wouldn't have been good enough for Madame Shell, Renee later wrote. She would have been picketing Gasoline Alley. As Icarie Shell battled rain on the speedway, Paris fell to the Nazis. After the 500, Lucy instructed the team to sell the Maseratis and she herself decamped to her home in Monaco. She did not return to motorsports after the war, at least not officially. By 1947, her son Harry was making a name for himself on the European sports car circuits. Harry would go on to be the first American in the newly organized Formula One championship. Yeah, see them celebrating together. He later would enter cars sometimes under the name Le Curie Bleu, keeping his mom's team alive in motor racing. Now, uh, a couple of notes. Looking at that Maserati she sent to Indy, which was an Italian car with Franco-American livery and her Irish name on the side, you might wonder how Lucy felt about her nationality. And any contemporary would have been forgiven for thinking the shells were French nationals, speaking fluently. Yet the Shells and their sons considered themselves American through and through. They are listed as American in every race entry and result. And here we even have her own quote, I'm an American, I love automobiles, and I love France. And I'd wanted to contribute to the rise of French prestige. I think also briefly interesting was I saw how Lucy really intended that the O'Reilly name, her name, would be carried on um, on his... Uh, birth record at the U.S. consulate, Harry's last name is capitalized as O'Reilly Shell. And Harry himself often used O'Reilly and was listed in, under O alphabetically. And uh, that's his draft card. It kind of reminds me of his delivery on his mom's car. And in fact, during Lucy and Lori's lifetime, the International Herald Tribune referred to them as Mr. and Mrs. O'Reilly Shell, when of course Lori was not an O'Reilly. Uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. So uh, I know we didn't get a chance to go too in-depth, but I just want to thank you so much for having me here today. And I just hope I've piqued your interest about Lucy and her life. And believe me, there's a, a lot more there to discover. And I hope I've left, yes, time for any questions, if there are any. Um, thanks. Oh, yeah, I'll open them. I'm going to open them. Hi. Um, I read the book Faster, uh -huh. and fascinating book. Everyone should read it. Mm. Um, I thought I knew a lot about that period of racing, but never heard of Lucy O'Shell, O'Neill O'Shell, until I read the book. And then mm. you also expounded on some of her other accomplishments that the book didn't mention. Other women got their due during that time period. Do you have any theories why historians have pretty much forgotten about her? I think it's interesting. I. I alighted a little bit for time some of the mentions of her in the press. So in a press clipping that I had up and I can bring up again, it had mentioned basically the reporter 
mentioned everything about the creation of her new Grand Prix team and talked to everyone, Monsieur Charles, Rene Dreyfus, and her husband, and never actually mentioned her. Even when in the article, Monsieur Charles said, this team isn't mine. The, the, the woman, the madame, she created it. And the reporter still never bothered to talk to her. Um, I found, too, later that um, in some secondary sources, they might mention Lori as being running the team when that just wasn't true from the primary sources we have. Um, it was kind of incredible to me, and I couldn't, honestly, I can't make sense of it, because to me, it's like trying to tell the history of Mercedes F1 and not mentioning Total Wolf. It's like trying to talk about Red Bull Racing and making only a passing reference to a Mr. Ginger Spice, is how I feel about that. So. It's, I, I think there was some intentional, and I think also sometimes people just re received common wisdom, you know, so that's what I think. How much do you think Lucy's family fortune played a role in her life in motorsports? It was everything. It was everything. Do you think she would have had the same role in motorsports no. without it? No. Or any? And not any. Why? Because money created access. Women didn't have access. Now, there were a lot of women driving at that time, but women ownership, it really was her money creating it. I think she inherited about, in that day's money, about nine million bucks when her dad died, and that's in, you know, 1930s money. So you can only imagine maybe 150 million a day that she had to spend. Questions? Okay. I was just uh, wondering that car, the, the Indy car, that's in the museum? Yeah, that, it's there was, at Revs. Was it damaged, the museum, from the hurricane or anything? Oh, no, every, everything at Revs is great. Okay. So please come on down. In fact, they're having a, uh, a conference there next weekend. Uh, just a couple of statements. I believe that she sold the two cars to Lou Moore after the, the race at Indy, is mm -hmm. that correct? Yeah. And uh, Harry, her son, was killed uh, practicing for a Grand Prix in 1955, is that right? He was. He was driving for, I believe it was uh, the, the Yeoman Credit Union. It was Sterling Moss's outfit, yes, during free practice. Now, when she got uh, Dreyfus out of France, he was already in the French Army, and mm -hmm. I understand that uh, they let him go because he was going to Indianapolis. Yeah. Now, how much of that was a plan to get a, Jew a Jewish driver out of France before the Germans caught him? That's, that's a really interesting question. And it's something I haven't found yet, but it doesn't mean the answer is not there. There's, in fact, stacks of her letters that, that just have never been digitized. Um, we know for sure she, that Dreyfus himself says, my friends told me not to come back after Indy. I, he didn't say which friends, though. She was a, a, a confirmed anti-fascist at the point that there were certain French who were, who, who were pro-fascists. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, I, I love so much the little news clipping about her work as a nurse and talking about the French battle against the Germans. And really, uh, the uh, arrival of the French drivers for the Indy 500 was a media spectacle. And uh, Dreyfus actually gave out headshots of him, signed headshots of him in his military uniform. So it really was um, sort of the, there was public pressure against the, uh, the Minister of Information to release these two drivers, Rene Dreyfus and the other man I didn't mention, Rene LeBeg, uh, as sort of promotion for France and for the French war effort. And it was important. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? That gentleman back there. First, thanks for filling in a blank in my personal knowledge about Harry, who Harry Shell was and where he came from. Yeah. I always wondered about that. Uh, I'm just picking up the last uh, comments. Uh, you didn't mention that Rennie de Refus, Rennie Refus, uh, when he ended up here in the USA, became well known to the 50s yeah. for, Le Ch Ch for his restaurant, Le Chant mm -hmm. in, in New York. I had the privilege of dining there once. Yeah, it's, it, his autobiography is honestly, it's terrific. I highly recommend it. Anyone else? Uh, 
So when are you making a movie of the story? <laughs> I, this is what I'm hoping. I'm hoping the more people get excited about it, the more there's a groundswell, and I think there's a real hunger for stories like this. And to me, one of the things I learned when I learned about Lucy is, yes, yeah, she, was, she was rather unique in, t in terms of being a team owner and principal of a Grand Prix team. But in terms of being a driver, every time I went to the French papers to look for results, any time a woman was allowed to race, there are madames and mademoiselles scattered through the results. They're all there. And um, I, I had no idea. Just another comment. When uh, Wilbur Shaw uh, persuaded uh, his car owner to buy, buy the HCTF the year before, uh, their Cotton Hennings, their mechanic, changed the firing order on that car mm. um, to smooth it out. And uh, it was uh, more successful in Indianapolis, to say the least. Mm. Now, the car that it, it revs now belonged to Dean Butler at one time, mm -hmm. and he got his uh, restorer to change the firing order also. And I was at Milwaukee when Emil Andrews, who uh, I believe came in second in that car at Indianapolis, yeah. drove it again, and he came in and said how great it was if it had been that good at Indy to won the race. That's amazing. That's amazing. And I, I want to say, too, not only did Lucy get Rene Dreyfus out of a, into America, out of France, but also Luigi Canetti, who was the reserve driver on that team. And he stayed in America and, of course, founded North American Racing Team. So. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah, thanks.